Okay, it's time for the video you've all been waiting for. We're going to talk about the significant Cold War conflict you've all heard about. Western powers versus communist-aligned guerrilla fighters in the jungle, driving a long conflict which would cost many lives. Widespread use of chemical defoliants would... Hello? Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay, wait, you're saying that because of thumbnails and titles, you can't set up a bait and switch and everyone already knows this video is about the Malay emergency? No, it's impossible. <laughs> well, that sucks. What hack wrote this anyways? Anyway, I'm your host, David, and today we'll be talking about, yes, the Malay emergency. This is the Cold War. This is Malaya. For around two centuries, the British Empire held control over this region. It was a group of states referred to as British Malaya, protectorates set up after rulership by the East India Company, but that's a different story. Like many European colonies in this region, during World War II, Malaya came under occupation by the Japanese. Before, it was a major exporter of rubber and tin, both resources the British economy relied upon. However, primary commodities are vulnerable to massive economic fluctuations based on the price of their goods. This volatility meant enormous boom and bust spikes, causing extreme poverty for the indigenous Malay people. The production of these commodities attracted Chinese workers to come to Malaya and more or less dominate a few key industries. Most important being trading ports and tin production. This meant the Malay people found themselves working primarily in the rubber production industry. This exacerbated their economic volatility. Even amongst volatile global market prices for commodities, rubber was particularly vulnerable. This was the simmering pot of economic and ethnic tension before the Japanese took over Malaya in 1941. Exports of commodities tanked as the requirements of the Japanese empire were much lower than the global market. Malaya's economy was so dire, many of their mines and rubber plantations were simply abandoned in favor of growing the basics to feed themselves. This resulted in a massive famine in 1942. By the time the war was over and Britain put back in charge of Malaya, the situation was dire. Malaya experienced mass unemployment coupled with skyrocketing food prices. And as you can no doubt imagine, an unemployed and hungry population is a prime recipe for instability. There were massive strikes and riots in Malaya, and the British colonial authorities, who were relying heavily on that tin and rubber to rebuild Britain, reacted brutally. There are reports of mass arrests and even deportations of dissenters. One group organizing many of these strikes and demonstrations was the Communist Party. Oh yeah, this is why it's over here on the Cold War channel, obviously. The unrest would escalate, however, in June of 1948, when four Europeans were assassinated in a plot by an unnamed gang of young Chinese men. The British reacted by invoking emergency measures and making leftist parties illegal, most notably the Malayan Communist Party, or MCP. Anyone working for or helping a leftist group was to be arrested by colonial police. The communists rallied into the countryside and formed a guerrilla army called the Malayan People's Liberation Army, or MPLA. Now, this conflict is hard to summarize in terms of battles. Much like when we eventually get to the war in Vietnam, the Malayan emergency was more of a guerrilla war, consisting of raids, sabotage, and hunting down highly mobile fighters within dense jungle. The MPLA was outgunned and outnumbered, just like the communist forces in our video about the Chinese Civil War. They knew direct engagement in pitched battles would result in their loss. Their focus instead was on targeting colonial infrastructure and retreating into the common populace. In this case, particularly the ethnic Chinese communities who supported them. Ethnic Chinese people living in British Malaya had limited civil rights, no land, and were pretty poor overall so you can probably understand why they would support a communist uprising. The chaos of this kind of fighting was uncommon for the British, and the colonial authorities had trouble 
deciding how to respond. Fighting insurgents in the jungle was not how British officers learned about warfare in military school or even during much of the Second World War, so they went on the defensive. Often their attempts to protect sites like tin mines or rubber plantations would be undermined by the local populace. They were more loyal to the insurgents than the British, another complication the British had no idea how to combat. That is until 1950 when the British assigned General Sir Harold Briggs to head the Malayan situation. He understood the importance of logistics and supply lines. His new plan was to try and cut off the MPLA from their supporters, giving them supplies and letting attrition from life in the dense jungle wear them down. So Briggs' plan focused on attacking the MPLA's food supply. The first one being the ethnically Chinese populace living on the edges of civilization, giving them support. He accomplished this by capturing and forcibly relocating more than a million Malayan and Chinese squatters into the very euphemistically named New Villages. These villages, and totally not concentration camps, had guard towers, spotlights, and barbed wire fences. The British fiercely controlled who could enter and exit to make sure the insurgents could not make contact. We'd also be remiss if we didn't point out this forced relocation happened alongside horrible violence directed at civilians by British forces. There are many reports of the British using torture and brutal beatings to get information out of suspected supporters. They would try to identify people close to the insurgents by publicly parading the insurgents' corpses, or just their decapitated heads, in the villages to see who would react. They also burned villages, booby-trapped food supplies, shot civilians, and in one infamous case, known as the Batang Kang Massacre, murdered, mutilated, and burned 24 villagers. The other two sources of food Briggs wanted to combat were the clearing of the jungle to make farms and gathered food from jungle-dwelling indigenous allies of the MPLA. To combat this, and to make it harder to retreat into the forest, the British utilized chemical defoliants to destroy crops and swaths of jungle to starve them out. They used several chemical agents to do this, one of the most important, and one you should just file away for when we get to the Vietnam War, was 2,4-dichlorophenoxyacetic acid. It's more commonly known by the name of Agent Orange, but we here at the Cold War insisted on using the full name just to torture me with the full pronunciation. They also took stock of the 13 British battalions they had assigned to this conflict and concluded that they were far too undermanned to fight an insurgent war against the MPLA. So they decided to organize a surge, and that meant getting some outside help. Now, 1948 was not all that long ago, but it's still hard to imagine what the status of the British Empire was at that point. Today, we think of the United Kingdom as a little nation. However, at the time of the Malayan Emergency, Britain still clung to a messy, globe-spanning empire which was admittedly just on the cusp of falling apart. That being said, they drew from across the world in gathering troops to put down this rebel army as they grew more desperate. The conflict involved mobilizing the Royal Australian Navy, as well as the Royal Navy, and the Royal New Zealand Air Force. Also in the conflict were imported troops from Australia, Rhodesia, Fiji, and Kenya. The British were willing to draw upon anything they could to suppress this conflict. After the assassination of the British High Commissioner in 1951, and the election of the Conservatives, led of course by Winston Churchill, in 1952, the British decided it was high time to change tactics. London assigned a new High Commissioner, General Gerald Templet, and he wholly altered the strategy of the conflict. The British replaced leaders and attempted to sway the Malayans to sympathize with them, rather than the Communists. They did so by use of medical and food aid, often called a hearts and minds campaign. To turn the disenfranchised ethnic Chinese population, the British pushed for giving them the right to vote. Then they began to send patrols into the jungle to combat the MPLA in the brush. Malaya's Secretary of Defense had extensive experience in jungle warfare from fighting in Burma during World War II, so his experience made him invaluable. This was a successful venture. 
The challenge to the MPLA's food supply made them resort to more drastic tactics, including extorting food from those same indigenous people who had supplied them earlier. The MPLA's list of allies began to decline. People began to defect to the British and give over their secrets and intel. Within a couple of years, the MPLA lost two-thirds of its strength. That death of High Commissioner Henry Gurney in 1951 soured the Malayan population to the MPLA, reframing the conflict to many Malayan people as an ethnic one between them and the ethnic Chinese community. During the conflict, the British gave Malaya a modicum of independence, founding the Federation of Malaya in 1955. This new government offered amnesty to communists who wanted to surrender and give up their communist activities, which didn't really go anywhere despite their best efforts. Failed peace talks resulted in the rescinding of the amnesty anyway. After the full independence of Malaya in 1957, those few remaining insurgents lost all real cause to fight, and many fled the country. Now, this was the end of the conflict, the state of emergency dropped, but the story isn't over. A second insurgency, after the rise of a communist leader by the name of Chin Peng, would emerge in 1967, continuing all the way until 1989, but that's a story for another day. Also, the Malayan Emergency often gets a reputation for being a prologue to the Vietnam War. And while there are important differences, the use of chemical defoliants, resettlement, and strategies used by the British would be picked up by the Americans under similar strategic conditions in Vietnam. This also shows another aspect of the Cold War dynamic, which will show up again and again. While the Cold War is often framed as an ideological struggle between capitalism and communism, on the ground, this dynamic can map onto many different struggles. In the Malayan emergency, the communist insurgency was fueled not only by ideology, but the struggle for Malayan independence from colonial rule, and ethnic tensions between the Malayan and Chinese populations. Tensions on the ground gathered around the communist-capitalist dynamic and exacerbated it, oftentimes leading to some of the most brutal and horrific acts committed in the name of this conflict. We hope you've enjoyed today's topic, and to make sure you don't miss future episodes, please make sure you subscribe to our channel and press the bell button. We can be reached via email at thecoldwarchannel at gmail.com or on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash thecoldwartv. We rely on our patrons to create these videos, so consider supporting us via www.patreon.com slash thecoldwar. This is The Cold War Channel, and we will catch you on the next one.